speaker cannot have overlapping sessions. Is it when? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, so, um, Ronan, are you the host? I am. Oh, okay. Aaron was here, and I thought was the host. Oh, Ronan left us. Okay, hi, everyone. It looks like people are joining the session for um, uh, civil engineering. I'll just I'll just wait a couple minutes before I start the presentation to be sure everyone joins up. Here we have Ronan and Aaron. Let's wait uh, maybe uh, another minute or so. My name is uh, Ted Sherwood, by the way. I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I'll just, I'm gonna, in a little bit, I'm gonna give you a little presentation about civil engineering and about our department and our programs here. But like I said, I'll just wait a few more minutes to let everyone show up. So looks like almost to everyone has shown up here. So if you have questions uh, during my presentation, just go ahead and put them in the Q&A here. Uh, we may not be able to see the chat, but if you put them in the Q&A box, uh, the host will uh, be able to um, um, send them on to me. Oh, we still have one or two more people showing up. Okay, I'm uh, going to go ahead and get started and perhaps people will continue to show up. Oops. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, like I said, my name is Ted Sherwood. I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And I'm going to give you a presentation today about our program in civil engineering. So first of all, <clears throat> our uh, department hosts uh, three separate undergraduate uh, programs. I, uh, we offer a degree in civil engineering, degree in environmental engineering, and a degree in what's called architectural conservation and sustainability engineering. They're all very similar programs, uh, but they focus on different aspects. They both sort of grew out of civil engineering. Civil engineering is a very large discipline and environmental engineering and architectural engineering have grown out of them, okay? Uh, anything that you can do in environmental engineering or architectural engineering, you can also do with a civil engineering degree. A civil engineering degree is very um, broad, uh, gives you a degree in a very broad discipline, wide range. Environmental and architectural are more focused. So in order to understand what civil engineers do, you have to understand where the word engineer comes from. It comes from the Latin word ingenium, which means talented at solving problems, but also of good character. So the Romans would describe uh, someone as ingenium if they were sort of clever, ingenious people, uh, but also if they upheld a high ethical and moral standard as well. Uh, and that's expected of engineers today. We're a regulated profession. Uh, we have a code of ethics uh, that we have to abide by, and we're professionals. We're a profession and a four-year degree from Carleton, plus some years of work experience, you'll be able to get your PNG designation. Now, you can contrast that with the Latin word scienta, which means knowledge. So scientists are interested in knowledge insofar as how it can help them. So, uh, uh, scientists are interested in knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. Uh, engineer, which is a laudable goal, but engineers are interested in knowledge insofar as how we can use it to solve problems, okay? So we take knowledge discovered by scientists and apply it to real world situations. Uh, so sometimes we're called, say, applied scientists. And indeed, if you get a master's degree from Carleton, you can get a master's of applied science, okay? Now, some engineering schools in Canada give degrees in Bachelor of Applied Science, BASC. 
Uh, others like Carleton div give degrees, a B Eng Bachelor of Engineering, they're the same thing. So there's no difference between a Bachelor of Applied Science or a Bachelor of Engineering. Uh, so graduates from our programs in civil, environmental, and architectural conservation and sustainability, what we do is we design, construct, and maintain the physically and naturally built environments for the benefit of the public and in support of civilization. So we form the foundation and bedrock upon which civilization is based. And in Canada, we do our jobs so well that we're kind of taken for granted, which is actually not a bad thing, okay? Because we have terrific schools of engineering in Canada. We have a very old, very well-established tradition of civil engineering in Canada, where this vast wilderness was transformed into cities and communities. Uh, that are the envy of the world. And that was thanks to the hard work of civil engineers. Uh, and when I say we're taken for granted, is that this, is, this happened a few years ago. A large sinkhole opened up on a large highway in Ottawa, Highway 174. Um, and so people, and this is a highway that links or leans to downtown. Uh, and this sinkhole messed up people's commutes for about a week or so, okay? Uh, but now this was a civil engineering failure. So this was a civil engineering problem that civil engineers had to come in and fix very, very quickly. Um, but uh, this was so out of the ordinary that it made the national news on CBC. Peter Mansbridge on the national, the night this happened, had a segment about it. Uh, but the thing is, is that if, you know, I'm a structural engineer by train, okay? And before getting into academia, I worked in I worked as a consultant in Toronto, designed buildings and whatnot. Uh, but the thing is, if the buildings that I designed crashed as often as Windows ninety eight did, uh, I would be in jail. And yet, Bill Gates is a billionaire. Okay, so there's no justice in the world that uh, you know proper functioning civil infrastructure is taken for granted by the public. But that only comes about through very, very hard work, good education, hard work, and talented engineers. So first off, what is civil engineering? Well, this is what Carleton civil engineering students look like uh, on a field trip. So do, uh, civil engineering is a very broad discipline, like I said, and we have broad sort of sub areas within civil engineering. Some civil engineers focus in geotechnical engineering, Geotechnical engineers uh, engineer humanity's interface with the earth. So they engineer in soil and rock foundations, dams, mines, tunnels, these sorts of things. Structural engineers, which is what I am, we design buildings and bridges, power stations, these sorts of things. If you love bridges, structural engineering is the way to go. If you love buildings, structural engineering is the way to go. You can work with architects to design buildings. It's fantastic. Transportation engineers engineer the safe and efficient movement of people and goods. So they design, say, roadways, railways, airports, uh, public transit systems. So a transportation engineer on the left here would have designed all of the geometry of that interchange. They would have designed the geometry of all the curves. They would have uh, designed the pavement and the asphalt systems for those roadways. <laughs> a structural engineer would actually design the overpass itself because that's a structure subjected to the load of the traffic. But the transportation engineer would give the structural engineer the required geometry of that overpass. Uh, and transportation engineers also plan for what, you know, this interchange needs to look like, say, 75 years from now. So transportation engineers get into urban planning as well. Hydrotechnical engineers deal with engineering in large scale, large scale water systems. Uh, so ports and harbors, coastal systems, uh, irrigation systems. On the left here, this is a, a canal bridge. So one canal passing over another canal. And the people in these houses hope that this levee was designed by a talented civil engineer. And the ones in New Orleans were not. Municipal engineers kind of bring all of those previous disciplines together. 
and they design water supply networks, sewer and drainage systems, solid waste management. Um, and so this is where civil engineering and environmental engineering sort of interface with one another. Uh, civil engineering and architectural engineering interface sort of at the structural engineering uh, area. Municipal engineering is where civil and environmental interface with one another. And there's a significant overlap between the two. So uh, what is environmental engineering? Well, this is what environmental engineers look like here. Okay. Um, and so what is, an envir what is environmental engineering is a little bit more uh, subtle. Um, because clean parks, clean cities, uh, clean communities, that is what environmental engineering is, okay? Because in order to have healthy cities and healthy communities, you need sources of clean drinking water, waste disposal systems, and clean air. So those are the things that environmental engineers are called upon to provide to society. Very heavy in, say, chemistry and biology. Uh, and you can, I've stopped updating this slide because it's too depressing. Uh, so long as there continue to be humans living on the earth, there will be a call for, say, civil and environmental engineers to clean up our messes. So environmental engineers can be called upon, say, to clean up messes that industry cause or work with industry to design safe industrial processes to dispose of their wastes safely, okay? And they can also work with, work with regulatory agencies as well. So environmental engineers in our programs, there's, this is again, this is what environmental engineering students look like on a field trip. So they work with water and wastewater treatment, designing both the plants to do that and the processes they work in air pollution control, solid and hazardous waste management, groundwater pollution remediation, and doing environmental impact assessments, okay? And environmental engineering grew out of civil engineering about 25 years ago or so. But like I say, there's a lot of overlap between the two programs. And there's we have a particular expertise at Carleton on water and wastewater treatment, okay? So there's particular emphasis in our environmental engineering programs on designing water treatment systems. Now, what is architectural conservation and sustainability? So, <clears throat> like I say, we have an pro undergraduate program in this. Uh, and what this program is, is basically we take the structural engineering program out of our civil program. We focus solely on the structural engineering, marry it, with some courses in architecture and some additional courses in say um, um, en uh, energy efficient building design and building rehabilitation. So it's focused on buildings as you would think from the name architectural with a focus on say designing new buildings, rehabilitating existing buildings with a focus on energy efficiency, okay? Um, and so here's some examples of say way architectural conservation and sustainability engineers can work on. Say, you know, we have civil and architectural engineers working at uh, Parliament uh, Hill, rehabilitating that. Uh, we have uh, people working on design of new energy efficient buildings uh, and whatnot, okay? So if you're interested in say architecture and buildings, this is a good option for you. Uh, but everything that you do in the other programs, you can do in civil as well. The advantage of civil engineering is that it's a very broad discipline. It's, I would argue, the broadest of all engineering disciplines. Uh, it's also the oldest uh, discipline of engineering as well. Mechanical engineering, for example, grew out of civil engineering about 200 years ago. Uh, and the greatest of all the ancient uh, civil engineers were, of course, the Romans, and throughout much of the history of Rome, the third most powerful man in that city was actually the Roman water commissioner, the person responsible for bringing fresh drinking water to the citizens of Rome. And he, among other things, was responsible for maintaining Roman aqueducts. So just an extraordinary work in, say, structural and geotechnical and environmental engineering, okay? And in 97 AD, 
he wrote the very first engineering report. Now, if you become engineers, you'll be spending a lot of your time writing engineering reports. And we put a lot of focus on how to do that in our undergraduate programs at Carleton. And in the very first one, in 97 AD, he wrote a condition survey on the aqueducts of Rome. And there's a sentence in there when he says, and I quote, compare, if you will, the idle pyramids or those other useless, though much renowned works of the Greeks with these aqueducts, with these many indispensable structures. So within those words, I think beats the heart of an engineer because he understands that while, you know, the pyramids are famous, they're also utterly useless, okay? Uh, so when he says these aqueducts, he means, you know, these aqueducts, Roman roads, Roman buildings, Roman sewers, all manner of Roman civil, uh, civil infrastructure. That is civil infrastructure was indispensable to the support of Roman civilization, okay? Uh, and this is still the case today. So if I were to modernize this statement for today, I might say, compare, if you will, the idle Apple Watch or those other useless, though much renowned works of the Sony PlayStation division with these bridges, schools, dams, roads, railways, energy efficient buildings, water treatment plants, irrigation systems, with that array of indispensable structures. You know, I, you know the Apple Watch is a terrific example of engineering but it's completely useless, okay? It's a plaything. Uh, the effort gone, gone into building bridges and schools, buildings, roads, railways, airports, that work is indis indispensable to modern civilization, okay? And that comes about from future engineers like yourselves. Uh, now, it's not entirely correct to say that all Roman knowledge was lost with the fall of Rome, <clears throat> but there was a lot of work during the Enlightenment to rediscover a lot of the ancient knowledge. And it took people like Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, and others to rediscover the ancient knowledge. And in the 1600s, Galileo really brought about a paradigm shift in how science was conducted. Uh, prior to this, science, if it was even conducted at all, was sort of influenced by the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greeks did science by way of thought experiments, just sitting down and thinking about things. They felt that actually doing physical labor of doing experiments was beneath them. Well, Galileo and others like him did away with that uh, attitude and said, in the discussion of physical problems, we ought to begin from you know sense experiences and necessary demonstrations. So he said, uh, argued that in order to understand the world, we actually have to do experiments and see how things behave in front of us, okay? Uh, and that still informs how we do science to get today, and in particular, at Carleton, how we do our undergraduate education. So you, if you come into civil engineering at Carleton, you'll spend a lot of your time in laboratories doing uh, tests with concrete and steel, uh, masonry, uh, wood, soils, you'll do work with soils, um, and, and this sort of thing with water. Because how can you possibly engineer, say, um, a foundation that's meant to hold back soil before you've actually worked with concrete in your hands, before you've actually worked with soil in your hands, and see how they actually fail in front of you? Okay. So you'll spend a lot of time in labs, uh, working with lab partners, doing this with your hands, okay? And I'll show you some pictures of labs that our civil engineering students do. Well, here's a photo of a couple of other things that we do is we focus on field trips as well. Now, this hasn't been as possible during the pandemic, but it's starting to come back. We take our students on field trips quite extensively. And in the bottom photos here, these are photos from one of our labs, uh, our concrete lab. And I'll show you more photos of these a little later. So the first person to call themselves a civil engineer was a fellow by the name of John Smeaton. Uh, and he uh, designed uh, ports and harbors, buildings. He's most famous 
for uh, building the Eddystone Lighthouse over the, uh, off the coast of Cornwall in the UK. And he rediscovered the ancient Roman material known as concrete. Uh, so perhaps one of the most influential people uh, for modern day who you've never heard of, he rediscovered this material known as concrete. Okay. Uh, and concrete is used everywhere, everywhere around the world, and modern society would be impossible without its use. Uh, and he called himself a civil engineer because he was a pacifist, and he wanted to distinguish himself from military engineers. Okay, He wanted his work to be for civilian use, for peaceful use, to build up society. Okay, uh, And one other thing that he did, he also was one of the earlier designers of steam engines in the 1700s at the dawn of the industrial revolution. Uh, and at the, so then at the time it was several engineers who designed steam turbines or steam engines, I should say. Um, uh, but then the steam engines technology advanced so greatly that people focused on that. And eventually the field of mechanical engineering was born. So mechanical engineering grew out of civil engineering uh, uh, due to the, disco uh, the discovery of the steam engine. So the 1700s, 1800s was a very exciting time for civil engineering, in particular in the British Isles and the British Empire. Uh, and one of my favorite uh, bridges in the world was built in 1890, the so-called Firth of Forth Bridge in Scotland. Now, these so-called firths in Scotland on uh, the east coast of Scotland, these are long, long inlets of the North Bay, and they head inland quite a lot. They're kind of like Norwegian fjords, except the sides of the firths aren't as high, okay, so they're low. <coughs> but they extend in a large way, and so traveling up sort of the coast of Scotland can be a challenge because you keep having to cross these firths. Well, short, you know, a couple decades before the Firth of Forth Bridge was built, there was a large um, bridge disaster in Scotland at the Firth of Tay in about 1870 or so. So the bridge, or the railway bridge over the Firth of Tay collapsed when a bridge, when a, a, a train went over it uh, during a major windstorm. And so that bridge collapse fundamentally shook the British people's faith in these large civil engineering infrastructure works, okay? So when it came time to build a bridge across the Firth of Forth in 1890, uh, the engineers, Baker and Fowler, were going to have a tough time convincing the British members of parliament to appropriate enough money to build the bridge. So in order to convince them that the bridge was going to be safe, they conceived of this very simple model to explain the very complex flow of forces through their design. Uh, and so th with this very simple model and a couple of paragraphs of description, they were able to uh, convince the British MPs that their bridge was going to be safe, uh, that it was going to survive windstorms, it was going to survive the weight of railway, of rail, of rail cars passing over it. So they got the money to build the bridge, they built the bridge, and it's still in use today, and it is an absolute masterpiece. At the time, it was the longest span steel cantilever truss bridge in the world. And even today, it's still one of the longest. Okay, So just a magnificent, wonderful bridge, an absolute gem. Now, when the most famous American engineer, bridge engineer, saw the bridge, he said of the Firth of Forth Bridge, and I quote, the Firth of Forth Bridge is the clumsiest structure ever conceived by man. An American engineer would take the money appropriated for that bridge, build the bridge, and return half of it to the owner. So when it came time to build a bridge across the St. Lawrence near Quebec City, of course, this engineer got hired to design the bridge. And his name was Theodore Cooper. Uh, and he was a very prominent, very successful engineer of bridges, very successful structural engineer. Uh, but he didn't have sort of that grand masterpiece that he could put to his name. And he wanted this Quebec bridge across the St. Lawrence River to be that <coughs> grand masterpiece. 
So you can see how much thinner the members were in his design. This is what the bridge looked like while it was under construction one day in 1907. Uh, when it was suggested to him during the design process that perhaps there were errors in the design, he would have none of it and reacted quite angrily to the design. Uh, when, you know, it was suggested perhaps we should just check the design to be sure it was okay. Nope, not interested. Well, this is what his hubris got him. This is what it looked like one day in 1907. This is what the bridge looked like a couple of days later. Okay, the bridge collapsed. 97 construction workers were killed in the collapse. Uh, as a result of this collapse, <coughs> a royal commission was started to investigate the cause of the collapse, and blame for the collapse was placed squarely upon the shoulders of Theodore Cooper. Um, he made errors in his design so fundamental that uh, he forgot principles that you will learn in your second year of undergraduate study here at Carleton, okay? Uh, for one thing, he never actually calculated what the weight of the bridge was going to be. That's another error he made. But he made errors in terms of the behavior of materials um, that, uh, that you will learn in your second year of undergraduate study. And in actual fact, you will do labs in your second year of undergraduate study on the very phenomenon that caused this bridge to collapse. And I'll show you photos of it later on. So as a result of this collapse, he retired in disgrace. Engineering became a regulated profession in Canada. The first building code, legally enforceable building code was written in Canada. It was for the design and construction of railway bridges, which is, should not be surprising, okay? And engineering is a regulated profession today, like I said, we have engineering regulatory bodies. In order to call yourself a professional engineer and designate yourself a PEng, you need an undergraduate degree in engineering, which we can offer you. And then with uh, four years of work experience, you can become a PEng. And also, um, the, the birth of the so-called ritual of the calling of the engineer was born. So this is um, a ritual that takes place outside of sort of your academic uh, the academics at Carleton. These are rituals that go on at engineering schools around Canada and some in some U.S. schools as well, where you will get your iron ring. So the iron ring is not an academic designation. Uh, it's, it's more of a, a symbolic designation that you've taken part in the ritual of the calling of the engineer and gotten your iron ring. And during the ritual, uh, like here's my iron ring right here, and I hope you can see it. The iron in the ring is symbolically from the Quebec Bridge. Uh, and when you take part in the ritual, you will swear to not be Theodore Cooper. You will swear above all else to hold public safety and public good as your number one priority. So as an engineer, <coughs> your number one priority is to public safety and public good. It exceeds that of your uh, responsibility to your client, responsibility to your employer, your responsibility to your colleagues, to anyone else. Number one, your responsibility is public safety and public good. When I was working in consulting before I went back uh, to, into research, I can't tell you how many times my colleagues and I were sitting around a conference table and trying to figure out sort of a, a solution to a problem that our client had. And we'd say, well, our client wants to do this sort of structural thing on his project. And then we say to ourselves, okay, but what's the right thing to do? And sometimes the two did not jive. Sometimes what the client wants to do is something that we as engineers was just not, we're just not comfortable would be safe, okay? Uh, and so it's your responsibility to tell your client that. And uh, the good engineering firms have lost clients when they've done that, okay? So you have to risk the possibility of losing clients and losing business <coughs> in order to do the right thing. It's, it's part of the job, okay? And we try to teach you that here at Carleton. We have courses in engineering ethics and professional practice. So this is the engineer 
who designed the World Trade Center, Leslie Robertson. This is a picture of him shortly after the World Trade Center was built. <coughs> this is a picture of him shortly after 9-11. And uh, shortly after 9-11, he was interviewed by the New Yorker magazine. His name is Leslie Robertson, and like I say, he was the chief engineer for the World Trade Center. The World Trade Center was his crowning professional achievement. <clears throat> and his offices, the offices of Leslie Robertson and Associates, overlooked the World Trade Center. And his conference room had a very, very large open window that overlooked the still smoldering wreckage of the World Trade Center when this interview took place. So just at the end of this article, there's an interesting quote, and I'll just read it to you. So the interviewer, uh, John Seabrook, interviews Leslie Robertson. And uh, so the interviewer says to the engineer Robertson, quote, your structures have saved a lot of people, unquote. Robertson replies, yes, a lot of things worked well. People got out, and I suppose I'm proud of that but he was looking towards that unavoidable view from the window. And Robertson goes on to say, it's a tremendous responsibility being an engineer, he said, his voice breaking. It's a very imperfect process. It's not so beautiful as science. He struggled to keep his composure. I have a lot of tough nights. I'm still not sleeping. I go to bed for a little while, but I wake up thinking. I have so many thoughts. He put his hands over his eyes as though that would block out the thoughts. And after a minute, he said, quote, there are all kinds of terrible things that take place on this planet that nature bring upon us, that nature brings upon us. But this event, not only was it man against man, but it was live on television and we watched it and you could reach out and touch it, but there was nothing you could do. So uh, in my opinion, Leslie Robertson is a hero, and he's certainly a professional hero of mine. Lesser buildings designed by a lesser civil engineer would have collapsed as soon as those planes hit, okay? Instead, those buildings subjected to something so far beyond anything that anyone could have possibly contemplated. Uh, yes, they collapsed, but they stood up long enough so that 30,000 people could get out safely, okay? Lesser buildings would have collapsed immediately. So 30,000 people owe their lives to the skill of Leslie Robertson, the engineering skill of Leslie Robertson. And since 9-11, he's been completely humble, uh, completely open and honest and transparent about the design of the, of the, of the building. <coughs> the buildings, from a structural point of view, the buildings performed magnificently, okay? Uh, but he would never call himself a hero. Uh, but the real heroes in life are people who don't call themselves heroes. So moving on to happier topics. The nice thing about being a civil engineer, uh oh What's going on here? The nice thing about being a civil engineer is that every once in a while you can get involved in a project that affects the economies of entire regions, okay? So on the left, the Hoover Dam um, uh, uh, generated enough hydroelectricity so that Las Vegas could be born, which is either a good or bad thing. On the right, the Confederation Bridge linking Prince Edward Island to New Brunswick has been a fantastic improvement. Um, and of course, this is the Burj Al Khalifa in Dubai, um, soon to be exceeded as the tallest building in the world, but the tallest building right now. Magnificent, magnificent example of engineering and reinforced concrete. This is a, a cable stayed bridge in France. This tower right here is, ta is taller than the Eiffel Tower. So imagine designing a bridge where, you know, go ahead and design this really complex bridge 
going over a very, very long distance. Oh, and by the way, one of the towers has to be taller than the Eiffel Tower. That's awfully exciting. Uh, obviously, the use of computers has fundamentally uh, affected how civil engineers do their work from you know, ancient times to today, even from the 1960s to today. And so we spend a lot of time teaching our undergraduate students on computer methods of engineering. Okay, Everything you see here, these are projects done by some of our undergraduate engineers on computer modeling of structures and other things as well, modeling of geotechnical um, um, systems and transportation systems as well. So you spend a lot of time working in front of a computer. Okay. Now, where are we headed? as you say, a society. Well, top left is a photo of a bridge that collapsed on September 30th, 2006 in Laval, Quebec, because the infrastructure was getting old. A lot of our infrastructure was built in the post Second World War construction boom, and that infrastructure is getting very, very old. Uh, top left, bottom left, is what a commute looked like in much of the world uh, before the pandemic, okay? How do we get those cars off the road but still get people to work? Well, that's the task for transportation engineers. Bottom right is what uh, much of Northern Alberta looks like due to the exploita exploitation of the oil sands. Now, I'm not opposed to oil, uh, but we do have to rehabilitate land and areas after we have exploited it as a species, okay? That's bottom right. And you all know what top right is, okay? So all of these four photos sh show pictures of disasters that require solutions from civil engineers. And they require political solutions. Uh, just yesterday in the United States, the federal government passed a massive, massive infrastructure bill designed to deal with these four problems here, okay? Uh, well, we need similar investments in infrastructure in Canada, okay? And so these problems require solutions that civil engineers can provide, okay? But they require political will. So we need civil engineers to communicate highly complex technical solutions to politicians who are not technical people. So as an engineer, uh, much like Baker and Fowler with their Bridget, with their uh, Firth of Fourth design, we need to be able to communicate highly technical concepts to non-technical people, like politicians, like our clients, okay? We have to explain to our clients what the right solutions are. If you cannot explain to clients, you know, highly complex technical concepts, you're not going to be very uh, competent engineers or successful engineers, okay? Um, and so we spent a lot of time at Carleton teaching technical communication, how to uh, communicate technical concepts to non-technical people through, say, report writing and general technical communications. But I think our civil engineering program at Carleton is designed very well to solve those problems. First year is very much sort of an extension of high school. You learn the basics in physics and chemistry, mathematics, computers, and communication skills. Year two, you learn the fundamentals that underlie all of engineering. Okay? So mechanics, thermodynamics, engineering, mathematics. Year three is when you really start to focus on, say, the basics of civil engineering, where you would take courses in, say, structures, transportation, geotech, and water resources. Okay? And then in year four, uh, year three is when it really starts to look like a civil engineering degree. Okay. So in year one, you learn the science basics. Year two, you learn the engineering basics. Year three, you learn the civil engineering basics. And then in year four, you can specialize in different areas of civil engineering, or you can keep it general, you can focus on general areas. But we have a, an extremely wide variety of, of optional courses in fourth year that you can take, okay? And a particular feature of fourth year is a year-long design project. These are what the incoming average grades were uh, two years ago. Uh, so the average grade coming into civil engineering was 83.4%. Now that's the average. That was not the cutoff. Okay. And our first year class in civil engineering, the target is usually about 120. 
And in environmental and architectural conservation and sustainability, it's about 50 each, okay? And so obviously those numbers go down as the years go on, but that's our target incoming first year class size for civil engineering, 120, and the average high school grade uh, grade 12 average is 83.4%, okay? So if you have an average, say, in the low, in the mid-80s, uh, you'll be good. You should be good to get in, okay? We do have a co-op program, which I highly recommend. You can apply for a civil, a civil engineering co-op either out of uh, high school or once you get here, and I highly recommend it. The way it works is that uh, it becomes a five-year program instead of a four-year program. And basically what you do is uh, after your third year, after your third year, year here, you would go out and work in industry for a year. So instead of doing your fourth year of undergraduate studies, you would do a, a year-long co-op term, and then you come back for your fourth year. So it becomes a five-year program, okay? Now, I highly, highly recommend co-op. There is a minimum grade to be in co-op. It's uh, a, a B minus, I think, uh, either a B or a B minus to be in co-op, okay? So you need to keep your grades up in order to be in the co-op program. Um, but I highly recommend co-op. Uh, it, it's a great way to go. And the nice thing about doing a year-long co-op program is that you can come in and start working at a firm and see a project through from beginning to end, okay? The other co-op system that I'm sure we're all familiar with is Waterloo. Uh, now, Waterloo is a terrific school and, and all that. I went to Waterloo for my undergraduate degree. But the challenge of the co-op system at Waterloo is that you work for four months, then go to school for four months, you work for four months, go to school for four months. So there's no sort of long-term continuity at a firm. You come in and work for four months, and that's just sort of a snapshot, okay? You just work on the very surface of a project. A 12 or 16 month co-op term means you can see a project through from beginning to end and see all the entire steps of working on the project. You can delve much deeper into it. You can design something by the start and then by the end of it, see it completed and then work, okay? That's very exciting. So uh, I've, ta I've talked about how we take students on field trips. I'll show you some of the field trips that we do with our undergraduate students. We've had students go to Morocco and Mexico to assess historic buildings and Nepal as well. We've had students go to Tanzania to teach water treatment systems in rural areas, sort of benchtop water treatment systems in rural areas. We have students stay closer to home and work on Parliament Hill. Uh, these are some of my students in my fourth year masonry design course. So in normal times, I take students to a masonry training center here in Ottawa, where I pair off university students with uh, masons, actual practicing masons. And it's usually the ratio of two students to one mason. And the mason teaches the students how to build masonry walls. Because again, how can you possibly engineer a masonry building uh, without actually having built a masonry wall with your bare hands? Okay, so students tell me by far, this is one of their most enjoyable activities in their undergraduate studies. We have students building, say, small scale, tiny homes on, on campus. We have students measuring river flow on the Rideau River here on campus. Okay, and this is a photo of, these are photos of what some of our on-campus labs look like. This is so obviously during the pandemic, everything had to go virtual. And so this is a teaching assistant who filmed himself doing the lab so that when everything was closed and, and online, students could watch the lab getting done. But by the time that you get to la uh, this lab, this will all be back in person, I'm sure of it. Um, and so these hands will be you doing this lab, okay? This is a column buckling lab. This, is, this explains the principles that Theodore Cooper forgot, okay? These again, these are stills from a video of our concrete lab. This is a teaching assistant doing the lab and filming himself doing it. 
But by the time you get to this lab, this will be you doing it. This will be an undergraduate student building, conc uh, mixing concrete, building concrete cylinders, testing them, and then crushing the concrete in compression and taking the data from a data acquisition system. Again, how can you engineer with concrete before you've actually built it and crushed it and seen it fail right in front of you? And here's a soils lab. Again, this is the actual professor doing the lab and, and um, uh, doing tests on a uh, soil sample. But uh, by the time you come to do this lab, these hands will be yours doing these tests right in front of you. And this is how we've done lecturing during the pandemic. We're slowly getting back to online, to in-person now. And I expect by the time you come to do uh, lectures, say uh, next year or the year after, a lot more of this will be in-person, okay? So uh, we've had uh, professors do say lectures online. This is a professor, a professor using a document capture camera. These are, um, this is a, a a screen capture of my lecture notes. I lecture on a tablet and write the notes in front of students and record myself so students can watch me either live or a recording of me doing it live. So these are my lecture notes that I draw. Uh, and to the, my masonry building demonstration had to be demonstrated virtually. So this was a instructor demonstrating the building of a wall virtually. But again, the idea is that for, for this lab, students build this with their own two hands, okay? Uh, I never cease to be amazed by the student engagement in extracurricular activities. Uh, this uh, in-person activities will return in terms of competitions and student life and whatnot, okay? These are all undergrad, civil undergraduate students who have worked at, working on various projects and conferences and whatnot. One of our favorite undergraduate projects is the Great Northern Concrete Toboggan Race, where students have to build a toboggan that weighs under 300 pounds with a running surface of concrete and then race it downhill. So Canadian engineering schools across Canada take part in this competition. Uh, this is something that only engineers would think of doing. Uh, the, there's a bridge building competition that goes on at Concordia that many of our undergraduate students take part in where we, they build bridges out of popsicle sticks. Very, very popular competition. Hi, Ted. I just don't, I just wanted to let you know you just have a, like one minute left. Oh, uh, I have it as 1122. Uh, I guess we're 11, ending at 1125. Uh, the session is, is over. It's the next session start at 230. Oh, okay. Okay. I guess we're, uh, I have it as uh, 2.22. Or, okay. Yeah. Just a okay. couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll just, okay. I'll just end up uh, on this slide here. I often get slide uh, asked, where can people work uh, after they graduate? Well, I, I, I keep up to date with a lot of the students who, my students who have graduated through LinkedIn. And this is just some of the places where I see my students working and whatnot. So it's very exciting as a teacher to see my students working uh, at various civil firms where they obviously use the stuff that I've taught them, okay? So these are the places where you can work when you graduate and there's no end of job opportunities for civil engineers. If you're a talented at solving problems, if you get a good engineering education and if you um, uh, uh, uphold a high ethical and moral standard, you can make a contribution that will outlive you like the Roman engineer who built this bridge. Thanks very much. And I guess if you have any questions, don't go, uh, uh, don't put it in the chat box, put it in the Q&A box. And also at 2.30, I'll be going to a Q&A desk as well if you have more questions, okay? So are there any uh, questions that you want to ask? in the Q&A box. I believe Wen helped um, answer all of those. And, oh, okay. um, and also mentioned that if uh, if there are any other questions, um, that the, the booth is open and that you can go over to the academic session and ask your questions in the booth there as well. Perfect, sounds good. Great, thank you, Ted. Okay, no problem.